I'm about to explain how white supremacist groups became so deeply woven into law enforcement and our judiciary. I'm also going to explain what it means to be an anti-racist in this day and age. And lastly, I'm going to explain what I believe we need to do about it. What up, y'all? My name is Romney Malco. I am the founder of The Pep, and today we will be discussing white supremacy within our law enforcement and judicial system. My goal is to give you a better understanding of what we as an anti-racist population are actually up against in hopes that it might help us devise the meaningful strategies to dismantle what I believe to be the most dangerous terrorist organization in the United States of America. In the event that this video was taken down, please request an invite to peprequest.com where I will give you a link to a Google Doc so that you can download this video to your own device and upload it at will. Write that down right now, peprequest.com. We start with Larissa Moore and four of her law school colleagues. They did an investigation of the unsolved civil rights murders from 1946 to 1969. This investigation was done through a Syracuse University program called the Cold Case Justice Initiative. A very important piece of information that was uncovered during this investigation but has never been addressed by our government was that during the civil rights movement, one of the first orders issued to KKK members was to infiltrate law enforcement. They found hundreds of people who were victim of either police killings or killed by the Ku Klux Klan that have never been investigated thoroughly and are not on the FBI's list. And no one has any intention of ever investigating these murders. In 1991, a U.S. District Court judge found that Los Angeles Sheriff's deputies had formed a neo-Nazi gang called the Vikings. The Vikings made it their duty to terrorize black and Latino communities. But check this out, that same group of Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputies that the U.S. District Court judge defined as a neo-Nazi gang terrorizing communities of color was defined by the police department officials as a harmless social group. Harmless. Keep in mind that 70 Linwood residents filed reports claiming that this harmless social group partook in systemic acts of shooting, killing, brutality, terrorism, house trashing, and other acts of lawlessness and wanton abuse of power, particularly against people of color. This neo-Nazi gang sounds like a very fine group of people. Here's another one. John Berg, a Chicago police detective who supposedly had ties to the KKK. I could not find a document or a photo to confirm his ties to the KKK, but I had to mention it being that it was mentioned in a court of law. Starting in 1989, this dude was in and out of court for the torturing of black men in Chicago. Not just him. There was an entire gang of Chicago detectives who worked under him. He was the ringleader. Hold up now. You can't just say torture. Torture can mean a lot of things. My wife and kids torture me. What do you mean by torture? A list was eventually compiled of 105 black men men who said that they were suffocated with plastic bags, typewriter covers, and for those of you who don't know what a typewriter is, think of it as the first Blackberry, only a lot bigger. And then that came in a plastic case. Never mind. Other forms of torture included a hand-cranked electrical device which Detective Berg called his nigger box. There was a cattle prod and a violet ray machine, also known as a shock wand, all of which were used on the torture victim's genitals. Y'all want to keep talking about this? In addition, Detective John Berg would beat black men and teenagers into making false rape and murder confessions for which they would be convicted. But guess what happens in 1993? Detective John Berg gets taken to court again. But this time he was dismissed from the police force, was never charged, and continued to collect his police pension. The whole county was complicit. The officers, the lawyers, the judges, the politicians, they all knew about the torturings but wanted to keep it covered up. At one point, 17 attorneys with 12 clients combined who had all claimed to have been beaten by John Berg submitted a petition requesting that the Cook County Judiciary not be allowed to have any further involvement in their cases. The petition cited that three of the 50 Cook County judges were former Chicago police detectives, two of which had worked under John Berg. Six 16 judges were former state's attorneys who had direct involvement with the torture cases, meaning one, they accepted false confessions being beaten out of defendants, two, partook in prosecuting people who were tortured into making false confessions, or three, supervised the prosecution of those claiming to be torture victims by electric shocks to the genitals, constant strikes to the genitals, beatdowns and suffocation, and the list goes on. Another six of those judges had testified on behalf of John Berg at the police board hearing when the city tried to fire him for torture, and another three of those 50 judges had defended the city in these police brutality lawsuits. So you can see why these attorneys wanted their clients trial by a completely different set of judges, maybe even a completely different county. Every judge mentioned was somehow directly or indirectly connected to protecting John Berg during his torture lawsuits. But thanks to Lone Wolf Officer Frank Laverty, John Berg was eventually prosecuted in 2008 for charges related to the torturing of 120 black men in the city of Chicago. But if you really want to give credit where credit is due, the first person to make mention of John Berg's torture tactics in the court of law was Andrew Wilson in 1989. 
in 2006 an FBI intelligence assessment titled White Supremacist Infiltration of Law Enforcement stated that white supremacist groups were infiltrating law enforcement communities and the white supremacists in authoritative positions of law enforcement were seeking to recruit more white supremacists into law enforcement. This was during the Bush administration, so upon receiving these reports, the government immediately launched an attack on Iraq. I'm just kidding. And before Democrats get up on their high horses, I want you to know that both parties have received these types of reports from the FBI and other intelligence agencies, and both parties have opted to do nothing. Even skinheads were encouraging their members to become ghost skins of law enforcement. So to be clear, when a skinhead encourages members to become ghost skins, and I am quoting the FBI verbatim here, ghost skins are those who avoid overt displays of their beliefs to blend into society and covertly advance white supremacist causes. And that, my friend, is what you call a terrorist in a public servant's uniform. In 2019, while house hunting, a couple found a framed Ku Klux Klan application along with a bunch of other white supremacy paraphernalia while doing a walk of a house that was for sale. Guess who the house belonged to? Officer Charles Anderson of the Michigan Muskegon Police Department. And guess what? Just 10 years prior, Officer Anderson shot Julius Johnson, an unarmed black man, and was relieved of any wrongdoing. Well, the house hunters took a picture of this white supremacist paraphernalia and posted it on the internet. That went viral, and the Muskegon Police Department started getting tons of phone calls. As a result, Officer Anderson was placed on administrative leave for being in possession of certain items associated with the white, white supremacist, supremacist group. And that pretty much ended his 20-year career. He He'd been on the force for 20 years. Another report exposes hundreds of active duty and retired law enforcement officers across the United States are members of Confederate sympathizing and anti-Islam online militia groups. Studies have shown that there are thousands of active duty and retired law enforcement officers frequently engaging and contributing to online hate groups. By the way, these statistics were tracked by the Center for Investigative Reporting and they say that these law enforcement officers are explicitly racist in these Facebook groups, yet they face no repercussions. In 2016, 14 San Francisco police officers got caught sending one another these racist texts. Some of them read white power and some of them read all fucking niggers must hang and yet most of them remained on the force. When asked about the presence of white, white supremacists, supremacists in law enforcement, Norm Stamper, a former chief of the Seattle Police Department stated, there are police agencies throughout the South and beyond that come from that tradition. And he also went on to say that when they get fired for misconduct, they usually end up being rehired by another police department. Coal, iron, and railroad companies started leasing black inmates from the sheriff's department as early as 1865. You want to learn more about that? There's a great book titled Slavery by Another Name, The Reenslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II, written by Douglas Blackman. There are good cops out there, but we need to purge the precincts for the same reason that we've all been in quarantine. It's because the likelihood of white supremacists contaminating the, what, 1,300 or so police departments across the United States of America is pretty damn high. I'll even go as far as saying inevitable. At this very moment, hate groups in the USA are at an all-time high. The Southern Poverty Law Center's annual Year in Hate and Extremism report reported 1,020 hate groups in the United States of America. That rise is supposedly due to the backlash of the Obama election. I know I sound like a Debbie Downer, but this is the reality of law enforcement in the United States of America. Many of the people we regard as officers of the law are in fact ghost skins and white, white supremacists. supremacists covertly blending into society to further advance white supremacist causes. On top of that, these ghost skins and white supremacists are being shielded by something called qualified immunity. And qualified immunity basically allows law enforcement and other government officials to violate people's constitutional rights with virtual impunity. Okay, it's not that simple, but in order to prosecute an officer of the law or a government official for violating your constitutional rights, you have to prove that the rights you believe are being violated are established rights by the court of law. So in other words, you would have to find a case that is identical to your case, and then you would have to take the ruling from that case and use that ruling to prove that the rights that were violated in your case are identical to this established law that came from the ruling of this case. And by doing so, you would then be able to hold law enforcement or a public official accountable. Practically impossible. I'm not saying it can't be done. It has been done. But 
it really makes it difficult to hold law enforcement and public officials accountable. The Supreme Court themselves says this law protects all but the plainly incompetent and those who knowingly violate the law. And qualified immunity is one of the main reasons why law enforcement seems to be held to a lower standard. By the way, if you are seeing any value in this content, I beg of you to request an invite to Pep Request. Dot com. That's peprequest.com. PEP stands for the People's Empowerment Platform, and it's how I plan to keep the world informed. To go a step further, President Trump said he was willing to discuss police reform, but qualified immunity was a non-starter. He was not willing to discuss qualified immunity. So let me get this right. Our Supreme Court is knowingly or unknowingly granting qualified immunity to ghost skins and white supremacists who are using law enforcement to covertly advance white supremacist causes. And despite numerous reports from the FBI, the Center for Investigative Reporting, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and even Homeland Security who has issued their own report of extremists and white supremacists infiltrating law enforcement, our government, both Democrats and Republicans, choose to do absolutely nothing? That don't sound like a setup to you, fam? That don't sound like when, like when the kingpins get the goons to do their dirty work? No correlation there? I understand that it is not illegal to be recruited by a hate group, a white supremacist. In law enforcement seems to be a major conflict of interest. So think about this. My taxes as a black citizen of the United States of America are being used to pay the salary of a ghost skin who's using law enforcement to advance white supremacist causes. Still don't see the conflict of interest. Again, if this video is removed from this platform, please request an invite at peprequest.com and I will send you a link which will allow you to download this video to your own device where you can share it anywhere. So what do we do from here? Because this video is not all about how bad it is. This video is to give you a clearer understanding of what we are actually dealing with so that maybe we can devise better strategies. I do see hope in the way that so many are responding to this call to action. There is a group of us that are actually seeking to be educated beyond the typical meme or news excerpt. The voices of our activists are finally being amplified, which is raising a lot of awareness. We have allies. I got clown for talking about allies on my boys podcast back in the day, but that shit has come to fruition. The other thing is, the more I observe these white supremacists, the more I see repetition in their behavioral patterns. Those patterns can be dissected and used to predict some of their strategies moving forward. For instance, all of the protests, the global support, and all of these big companies stepping up on behalf of Black Lives Matter, there will be a lot of white reactionary politics. Police unions are going to be lobbying and campaigning and using scare tactics to convince you that the streets are going to be so much more dangerous if you allow them to defund the police. It's going to be anarchy. We're the only thing between you and the animals. And from my experience, particularly when it comes to elections, rationale cannot compete with fear. Another form of backlash will be a huge wave of real estate gentrification. In order to make white tenants feel more comfortable moving into these once underserved communities, the developers are going to request more policing in those areas. So not only will this lead to more arrests, but losing a family member to law enforcement will make it even more difficult to maintain the cost of a home in these areas. Business associations are also going to request increased policing. Local political parties and city council are going to be preying on anxious voters. Voter suppression they're going to try to make it so hard for you to vote. You find yourself waiting in line forever. And there might be violent attacks, if not already. There have been four black people hanging from trees with no rush for a thorough investigation on either case. And we cannot physically go to war with an armed group of white supremacists protected by the law. I'm getting in trouble for this video. Hopefully now you see why I say these ghost skins and white supremacists hiding behind law enforcement are the most dangerous organized terrorist groups in the United States of America. The urgent need to vote and spend as a collective seems more apparent now than it has ever been in my 51 years of life. And when I say collective, I am referring to anti-racist. I told you I was going to get in trouble for this one, but I don't just mean voting on a federal level. I'm talking about getting in city council's ass who acts as a legislative branch of your city's government. 
and they are involved in policy making. We need to form our own PACs, political action committees, pool our money together and make these political candidates do the dance like Samuel Jackson in Jungle Fever. Once we find candidates that speak our language, we put our money behind those candidates. And if we're really dope with our PAC, we will run ads and we'll run social media campaigns to help raise awareness about those candidates. We've got to lobby just like the unions, casinos, business associations. And if it all sounds confusing, welcome to the new normal. But we need to learn this shit. And this is the type of education I'm hoping to bring to the people again. I beg of you to request an invite at petrequest.com. It's a platform that I created for those who have messages that do not align with the mainstream narrative. And as far as spending goes, we need to find a way to identify anti-racist organizations because I don't want to give another dollar to a ghost skin or a white supremacist. Sadly, there are people of color who genuinely do not believe that this is their problem. There are people of color who don't understand the sentiment of Black Lives Matter. Further more, there are people of color who are genuinely against the anti-racism movement. That could be a byproduct of so many things. Colonialism, Stockholm Syndrome, self-hate, and the list goes on. Maybe I'm missing something, and I am open to the education. But when I look at this white supremacist owned conglomerate known as the United States of America, the only true leverage we, as people of color and anti-racists, seem to have within this country is our purchasing power and our right to vote. And we have to leverage those things, but it's time we learn how to leverage them correctly. We have to leverage them as a collective. That's going to take communication. That's going to take tolerance. And that is going to take organization. Yo, dog, we need banks that give non-biased business loans and home loans. Y'all might not know this, but the government of the United States of America has been actively involved in segregating black and white communities since the late 1800s. You want to learn more about that? There's a great book titled The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. And as always, links and references are always in the description. And it don't stop there. We need our own media. We need our own social media platform. Why do you think I created the peps? Because I was getting censored left and right on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Instagram. Damn. And I'm dead serious when I say we need a way to be able to identify one another. I don't know if it's a registry or what, but this is going to inform us on where we seek education, how we socialize, where we spend money, how we employ people, where we seek medical attention, and the list goes on. But the most important part of this is we need to organize our communities. Through organization of our communities, we can leverage the spending power and the voting power that we have. This conversation could go on forever, but I know y'all ain't got all that time. So I'm going to just stop right here. And if you like this conversation and want to continue it, please request an invitation to PetRequest.com. Again, that's PetRequest.com. My name is Romney Malco, and this concludes another episode of whatever you want to call it. <laughs>